Record on the computer. No, it's working. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. A few technical delays, but we are on the road. We have today to learn about Korach. Korach, Korach was a bad guy. And nevertheless, we have a whole Torah portion Korach after him. So it must be that somehow or other he has something good. I mean, to get his name written eternally in the Torah, you know, what people wouldn't be willing to do in order to have a thing, just to get your name mentioned in the newspaper, people are willing to do almost anything. So here we have his name is written in the Torah for all of those. This is like 3,300 years ago. <clears throat> it's been, people have been reading about him, Korach. It says Korach was um, not just a nobody. He was a very deserving person of all this, this advertisement. He was uh, intelligent and he became rich says he became tremendously rich from different, and he was, uh, we see he was tremendously influential, and he actually brought about unity in the Jewish people, unity in the Jewish people, everyone united against Moses. He united everyone, even his own tribe, the Levites, Moses' tribe, <coughs> unified the Levites against Moses. <clears throat> So what was exactly his is uh, the cause of his um, the cause of his uh, argument, and what exactly was it that convinced everybody to follow him? You know, there's people, there's always discontented people. With no matter what, people are always discontented with Moses, but it was rare that everyone opposed Moses. So here we have two cases where everybody did. One of them was with the Spies, we just finished learning about last week, the scouts, that everybody in Israel said, Moses, we're not going to go into the land of Israel. Moses says, yes, we say no. And here we have another case. But here it's not really so clear why everybody is following him, following Korach. You know, what exactly is the is the topic over here? <clears throat> what, what's, you know, are they arguing about, you know, border control or about, uh, you know, voting age or something? So here it's not really so clear about what they're arguing with. They're just arguing, and everybody is agreeing with, with Korah, which really makes no sense because even more because Moses did so much for the Jewish people, and Korah did absolutely nothing for the Jewish people. Right? Moses, it says that in the merit of Moses, he brought down the manna from heaven and water from the rock of Miriam, brought out <clears throat> because we see that when, when um, uh, Miriam passed away, when Aaron passed away, that in their merit was the cl the clouds that surrounded the Jews and the water from the rock, as the, the in the merit of Moses, it all came back. So really, it was in his merit <clears throat> that they were getting water and protection and bread from heaven. And he was leading them. He got the Torah. He took them out of Egypt. Okay, so what's going on over here? <clears throat> so we're going to see over here a little bit. There's a lot of explanations about this, by the way. A lot of explanations. But here we're going to see something a little bit um, more essential, deeper, a deeper logic, reason, what's going on. Externally, the people just got tired of Moses' rulership, this type of rulership. <clears throat> that Moses was a, a king and he told everyone what to do. And then we, maybe they, the people saw that they were always wrong and he was always right. And he took them out of Egypt and got the Torah and etc. But the people said, okay, good. You took us out of Egypt and you got the Torah. That's it. That's enough. You know, you're not, that type of leader we we don't need anymore. We got. Huh? They say they say it was the same. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good example, but I'll use it anyway. With Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, he was like a fantastic leader. He was like the only one in all of Europe that was worried about the rise of the Nazis. Everybody else is not so bad. And finally, he took over Winston Churchill, and he led successfully and inspired the, the English, the British, in World War II, and they succeeded. But then after the war, he didn't get elected, because they said, okay, you were really good for wartime, <clears throat> but in peacetime, we don't need you. Something like that, Havdil, was with was, was Moses. They said, okay, Moses, we needed you, <clears throat> your type of rulership, <clears throat> to keep telling us to do what we want, to negate our our will and negative understanding. We needed that to get out of Egypt. We needed to receive the Torah, but that's it. We got out of Egypt, we received the Torah. 
We all saw God in Mount Sinai. We don't need you anymore. That's a simple meaning. That's a simple meaning, whatever. But nevertheless, everybody, and why Korah? Why did he stand up? Who was, <clears throat> why did they pick him of all people? Like, okay, so we go. <clears throat> so this is going to be a little bit uh, Kabbalistic going on over here. Okay, just one more, one more, the, the, the foreword, one more prep, preparation for this whole thing, which this we've had a lot of times before. <clears throat> the, the, the Torah was given <clears throat> to the Jewish people, but for the whole world. The Torah was given to the Jewish people for the whole world. 99% of the commandments in the Torah are not relevant to other people. Non-Jews are not supposed to keep Shabbat, and non-Jews are not supposed to, <clears throat> to, to watch out for what foods they eat, and etc., except for limb from a living animal. But except for that, they can eat anything they want to. <clears throat> but what, what's the whole purpose of, of the Jewish people in the Torah? is to recognize the Creator. To recognize the creator, to recognize how close God is, how good man is, and how good the world is, the physical world. <clears throat> Not like the other religions that they try to get you out of the world, or they say, you know, everybody's a sinner, you got to, that's, that's a big lie, those are lies. In fact, man is made in God's image. In fact, the world is very good. In fact, God is very close. And that's the job of the Jewish people, to show the world these three things. And the way they do it is through the details of the Torah, to see how many details that there are <clears throat> in the Torah that the Jewish people keep. And that they do this only for the benefit of the world. But you have to have so many commandments, what for? And what do you have to benefit the world for to bring blessing to the world? Because that's what God wants. God wants this world to reveal its potential, physical world. And heaven is just sort of like an example of what God can do. But he's going to do it in this world even more. And that's the job of the Jewish people. So here we got an argument over here about how to do this. How to do this. Right? Korach versus Moses. And that, that's going to be the point of this whole, this whole business. Because logically, it makes no sense. How can the Jewish people, which they, let's say there's 20 million Jewish people, they're going to rule, right? They're going to influence and convince like eight, nine billion people to drop their religions and to act, how is how are they going to do that? Right, the, all the explanations on television and whatever, and they're they're not doing it with threats. You know, you want to burn in hell. You, this is the only way out. That's uh, that works. You know, that that convinces a person. But here we're talking about no, do what's good, do what's right. How is the how they're going to convince the whole world? So obviously, something there must be something good inside of everybody that can be awakened. <clears throat> that people suddenly realize who they are and on their own decide for their own good, not so much to avoid bad, to do what God wants. So what is this? That's, the, that's sort of the argument between Moses and Korah, how to bring this about, how to bring the uniqueness of the Jewish people into play, into the world. Okay, here we go. Vayikach Korach ben Yitzhar ben Kahat ben Levi. Korach, the son of... The Korach, the son of Yitzhar, the son of Kahat, the son of Levi. Okay, if you look at, it was like, what, two weeks ago, two passages. It talks about over the genealogy the, 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 of, of, the, of the, the Jewish people, and especially of Moses, how Moses came. So first of all, there was, Levi was one of the sons of Jacob. <clears throat> and Levi gave birth to three sons, Kahat and Gershon and Morari, three. And from Kahat came also three sons. And one of them was Amram, that's the, one of them was Uziel, and one of them was Yitzhar. And Yitzhar, he gave birth to Korach. Amram gave birth to Moses. The Yitzhar, he gave birth to Korach. <clears throat> Korach. So his name was Yitzhar. Yitzhar. So Yitzhar means oil. Right. So here we go, let's go. Lahavin Inyan. Machlokas Korach and his congregation against Moses and Aaron. But Rabot in the Midrash Rabbah, Pershazu, in this week's Torah portion, says, Omer Rav Levi, says Rav Levi, Loma Chalak Korach, why did Korach disagree? Why did he argue against Moses? As he said like this, listen to this. If you want to see something that makes no sense, here it goes, listen to this. Omar Korach said, Ani bano shel shaman. 
I am the son of oil. Oil, like olive oil. Oil. What? How does he get this, the son of oil? His father's name was Yitzhar. Like it says, it says, God will give the land of Israel to the Jewish people that you will, over there, you will <clears throat> eat your, you, you'll have, the, the, the land will produce for you wine and oil, Yitzhar. That I, I commanded, I swore to your fathers to give to you the land that produces this wine and oil. Okay. It says Tirosh is wine and Yitzhar, that's oil. Ubakolamash, this is what this is what Korach is saying to himself, right? And this works. It convinces all the Jewish people. He, he says to himself, I am the son of Yitzhar. My father's name was Yitzhar. Right? Moshe, his father was Amram. He was another one of the sons of, of Kahat. But he, my, Moses' father was called Amram. But my father was called Oil, Yitzhar. So it says, Yitzhar, that's oil. Ubakala Mashkin, all the liquids, Shetitan, Shemin, when you put oil, it always floats above. My Elu. And these, Moses and Aaron, Shinim Shechu B'Shemen, that they were anointed with oil, especially Aaron. Aaron, he was anointed with oil alone. Not L'Kuhuna B'Malchut. They took the, being the priest, the high priest was Aaron, and Malchut, that was Moses. They were anointed. Ani, <coughs> but I, Sha'ani Banu I am, I'm the source. They were just anointed with oil. But I am, Connected to the sun of oil. I am direct, come directly from oil. Uh, what, what, what type of oil did he come from? His father's name happened to be oil. Is Enu Nimshach, I shouldn't be anointed. And I shouldn't be, my family, they shouldn't be a high priest and a king. If oil is what does the trick, that makes you want to. So that I should, you know, they're just anointed with oil. Oh, wait. just one second. Shalom, Ranan. I'm giving a class now. Can you call me back in an hour? Thank you. Okay. Immediately, he disagreed with Moses. Ad Kadlashon. That's what it says. That's that's how it explains in the midrash. Because the Havans, let's understand this. But also, what the connection is to Korach with he says that he, another thing he disagreed with, he disagreed with the <clears throat> the priesthood of Aaron. That Aaron was the coin. He didn't like that, which we just saw, and he also disagreed with the mitzvah of tzitzis. Last week, if you remember, we learned last week's Torah portion. The last thing we learned about last week was the commandment of tzitzit. We talked about it also in Torah or. In in in, in, in Lukuti Torah and in uh, the Devar Malchut, tzitzit, tzitzit. Right, we talked about this, this, this yeah, on your garment. You have four garments. You have to put strands on the on the corners, right? So Korach disagreed with that also. That was an, an, a sub argument that he had. Like Rashi says, Tali Chakula Techilat Chayve B'Tzitzit or Patura. Korach stood with his. Always man, and he came. Hey, Moses, you're supposed to be a big expert in law. Uh, you got the Torah. Let me ask you a question. All of his friends are standing behind him and they're snickering, snickering. So, of talit, that is the talit, that's the garment, and it's totally made from blue, the blue dye. It's totally blue dye, the whole thing. Does it have to have tzitzit or not? Does it have to have the strands or not? Now, and, and the main thing of tzitzit, we learned this before, the main thing of the tzitzit is the blue strand. We talked about, now it says that since the temple was destroyed, we officially don't have this blue strand anymore. Some people say they found it, some people not. But nevertheless, we don't, but that's not, doesn't change it. The blue strand is still, <clears throat> it, it's still in effect, in effect. There are certain laws that if you, you can't do it, then you can, the one detail is missing, then you can still do the commandment. It's still permissible to do the commandment. So 
<clears throat> let's say the lights of Hanukkah. If you don't have eight lights to light, you can light one. That's good enough. But right? the same thing is with the tzitzit. If you don't have the blue strand, but the blue strand is the main one. So it says, and we'll see that the, later on the, the blue strand, that's the most effective spiritually of the whole business, the blue strand. It says that blue strand, that's what really what makes the tzitzit, right? Is the, that blue string. Well, what if you have the whole garment is blue? You dye the whole thing blue. If the main thing, why just one string that can do the commandment, how much more so the whole garment, said Korach? It said a garment that's totally blue, does it have to have those strings of blue on it or not? Moses said it has to have. He Everybody started laughing. Oh, 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 that's Moses, right? Moses doesn't know what he's talking about. And everyone was laughing. Did you hear what he said? And that was more, uh, Korach said, see, I told you, he's, you can't, can't have a man like this leading us. He doesn't know basic Torah laws. Of course, Moses was right and he was wrong. But what, how did he convince everybody, Korach, that he was right? Okay, Gam, Esau, it also says in the Gomorrah, Rabot, <clears throat> also another thing it says, that he was jealous because it says by the Levites, Paviru Ta'ar, that they have to remove all of their hairs from their head. The Aaron and Aaron, his brother, Kashtu, and Aaron, he had to remove his, the hairs from his head. And also, they didn't dress up <coughs> fancy. Aaron, the high priest, when he was working in the holy temple, as he had these holy garments, a breastplate and a beautiful hat and colorful a, a coat and meal and etc. Et all these things he had, and Aaron dressed up really nice, and he also had a long beard and everything. And they had to cut off all their hairs. The Levites had to remove their hairs. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember if they have to cut off their beards. Also, I don't think so, but we'll see anyway. We'll see in a moment. That, but the hairs of their head, for sure, they have to shave all the time. They have to remove. So this Aviru Tar Al Also, all of their the on the on the, 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 their their body. They had to remove their hairs. That's the thing of the Levites. The Levites had to remove their hairs. And Aaron, Kashto, Aaron was dressed up really nice. He had these beautiful things with a long flowing beard. Like we just finished learning last week, if you remember, like the Psalm, what is it? One, we said 143, huh? Like the good oil that flows down the beard of Aaron. Well, having calls that, I don't understand this. What we have to understand first, mat mazer, a little bit of the mitzvah of making tzitzit. The ketiv asu lachem tzitzit with a petil tchelet. This is going to get, get a little bit kabbalistic over there. We'll do it anyway. Tchelet v'zachartem, and you will remember all the commandments below the Turu, and you will not go after your eyes and after your heart. Okay, tzitzit. <clears throat> Basically. Korach wanted to do away with this commandment of tzitzit. Wanted to do away with it. He didn't like it. He didn't like it. It reminded him of bad things. It reminded him of, of, of Aaron and the Kohanim and their nice garments and that the fact that they could have hair. Right? They could have hair, beards, and then, then the Levites had to shave all this off to remove it all. And they couldn't dress in these beautiful garments. And that's also the fact that Korach said that I am direct descendant. My father was oil, and Moses was only anointed with oil. Uh, so what's going on? So the Rebbe said, okay, in order to understand this, let's first of all begin by understanding the idea of what tzitzit are. What is this commandment of tzitzit? <clears throat> now again, just to remind everybody that the Jewish people, they're the only ones that have commandments. And the reason we have commandments is because the commandments change the world. They're the connecting, the, the, the cord and the plug that connects the creator with the creation. Connects the creator with the creation. Now, the creator is creating everybody, and nobody feels it. And by means of the commandments, ideally, everyone will feel it. That's what it says. The world will be filled with the knowledge of God. Everyone will feel that they're being created. So every human being will feel how important they are to God. God is creating them. And they'll feel how 
important the world is because the only place you can feel that God is creating you is in the world. Even the angels don't feel it. A little bit, but not. And they'll feel how close God is. God is actually cares about what you do. That's the idea of the commandments. <clears throat> and Korach, for some reason, he wanted to do away with this particular commandment. We'll see about the rest, but the commandment of Tzitzit. Now, the commandment of Tzitzit is an example of all the commandments. Because it said, you look at the Tzitzit and you remember all the commandments. And we talked about that last week, if you remember. That the gematria of the word Tzitzit is 600 and there's eight strings and five knots. That comes out 613. The Indian is like this. The Hine, you see if it is written, Molekal or it's Kavodo, and God. We want God to be revealed in the world. Okay, there's two aspects of God, and we don't feel either one of them. One of them, it says that God fills the world. His glory fills the world. Kavodo, his glory means just a ray of godliness. The Kativ and it else is written, it's Shemayim the or it's Animale. And it says, the heavens and the earth, I fill. I, personally, the essence of God. Okay, so there's nothing except for God. But we don't feel this at all, right? Everything is God. So what does that mean? That the trees are God and the house is God and I'm God. So maybe we can just worship anything in the world, anything. So the answer is, yeah, maybe you can. But the Torah says you can't. Everything, in fact, is God. But there's certain ways that you have to act and you have to react to this fact that God is creating you from nothing all the time. Okay, so what am I supposed to do? You have to do what God wants. That's the Ten Commandments. Don't worship trees. You can only worship the God that took the Jews out of Egypt. Right? Don't worry. Okay. So essentially what it is, is that God is everywhere. And we totally don't see him. We don't feel him. It says, well, one of the reasons is because the creation covers over the creator. That's why God wanted it. But God is creating the creation also. That's also God. So it says that's an aspect of God that God uses and to conceal himself. Conceal himself. And we want to unify both of them. So Mamala call me, that's the aspect of how God articulates himself. That's what we call God's word, God's speech. And it creates all these details. And the more details there are, the more the creator is concealed. Mali call me. Right? It's not like music or art or something like that, where you know there must be a author to this, right? A, a Rembrandt's picture couldn't just come out of its own, right? The, the books of, of whatever it is, of, uh, you know, of Shakespeare or somebody, they just couldn't write themselves, you know, just through, uh, somebody must write it, right? there must be somebody. But the world is not like that. You can look at the world and say, maybe the whole thing, you know, just was always like this. Maybe it just, you know, came right by itself, just came together, right? There's big genius people that say this. And the reason they say this is because God conceals himself. That's what's called how God fills the worlds. The world, so to speak, <clears throat> conceal God. God is inside of them somehow. But then there's another aspect of the world, which is godliness, which is called sovim calming, that God <clears throat> surrounds and defies all of this concealment. That aspect of God we really can't understand. That we really can't. That's just too, too much for us. We can't grasp that level. <clears throat> Pure godliness, like at Mount Sinai when God revealed himself. Says everybody's souls jumped out of their bodies. Okay, so there is articulated God and pure God. Or you want to say God's word and God's will. Like it says, like it says, I am the Dodi. Okay, other my morning, he's pointing us to. They say, well, this is all the idea of Torah and the commandments. What do you mean, Torah? Hainu, Kasiv, it is written, Levushea, Ktalag, Chavir. His garments were like white uh, snow. The Sarashi and the hairs of his head, Ka'amar Nake, like clean, it means white, uh, the wool. Well, so the, his garments are like snow, white snow, and his hair is like <clears throat> white wool. What is this talking about? This is an amazing, frightening vision that Daniel saw. Uh, read the book of Daniel. I think this is like in the seventh chapter or something like that. And this is uh, after the, the vision that, he, that Nebuchadnezzar saw, where he saw that he the, the, told Daniel, tell me what the vision was and tell me what the explanation is. But then Daniel saw another one. And he saw he saw a, a, a man, a huge form. He says it was, Daniel himself says it was frightening what he saw. <clears throat> and then he pro prophesizes again the, 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 
Anyway, he prophesizes all these different exiles that the Jewish people are going to be in, including this last one, which is basically the church for the last 2,000 years, Gullus of Rome, it says, the exile of Rome. And he says, then he saw the, a man sitting on a throne. That's what he saw in his vision. A huge, huge man, frightening, awesome, bigger than the universe, bigger than the world. And he saw, and he had, his garments were like, garments were like white snow, and the hairs of his head were like white wool. Huh? Like white wool. Okay, so these are two different aspects of God. God has garments and God has hairs. That's what Daniel saw in his vision. <clears throat> I know. That aspect of God, which we said surrounds all the worlds, we said the will of God, that's called God's garments. That corresponds to the commandments. No one, You can't understand the commandments. Commandments are just something that are done without understanding. You know, God, really God, what type of God is that? He cares that you eat these matzahs on Passover. You got to eat them. You got to put on these boxes on your arm. You know, God really cares about that. So yeah, that's not just rituals. That's just, that's just you know, rituals that the, the rabbis made up that they like really, really bored the rabbis. And the, the Jewish people were really, really stupid. And they just been doing these things for like the last 3,300 years. These meaningless things with all these little details, and you spend like you know two, three thousand dollars for to fill in this one little letter. Uh, you, you lost uh, Jewish people like money, right? They, they appreciate it in any case. They don't want to throw away the money. One little letter is not right, and you're to fill in. You got to throw the whole thing away. Who's going to do that? And the Jews have been doing it even in Auschwitz for the last three thousand years. Why? So it's because God. It's God. That's what God wants, and that's what's called the garments of the king. The garments of the king. That's the commandments. Says Vizel, that's what that's the whole idea of the commandments. The commandments are called God's garments. Don't understand it. It's not it doesn't go inside. And that what Daniel saw that he said, the hairs of his head. These hairs, hairs, that's the Torah. And hair, that's the idea. That's what shines inside, like strands. That's what we call God filling the world. That's where the Torah comes from. Uh, that's where the Torah goes. In the commandment of Tzitzit, it's one of the commandments. There is in general also these two levels. Like it says in another mimer. Right? I am it says the atali is the garment. That's the, the, the of, of tzitzit. There's the garment, right? We have the garment here. It says the garment, <clears throat> the talit itself, that's the garment. Therefore, the main thing of the commandment is that it should be white. It should be white. That's what the garment of tzitzit. There's different people that white, different colored tzitzits and things like that. But we're not in that word. The, the, the talit. The ta, this is the talit. And this is called the tzitzit. This is called the talit. This is called talit. So the, there's what's called a small talit. That's worn close to the body. I wear it on the outside because it's just hot. Here in Israel, and that's, that, that's not any, for any sort of a Kabbalistic reason. Usually, Chabad does not wear a talit on the outside of the garments, but my it makes me break out. So, any good that's nothing to do with Hasidut, but that's just explaining why it's on the outside. So, that's this is the garment, and these are the tzitzit. That's good. This is called the talit. So, the talit is better that it should be white. Why it should be white and from, from wool, from wool and best wool of sheep. Why? Because it says in Daniel that he saw God and God had a garment and the garment was like white wool. Huh? White wool, so it says. That's the idea of soviv kolmim, how God surrounds and encompasses all creation. It's above the creation. <clears throat> okay, another question. But tzitzit, but the, the, the strings, they are also mimi and kanaf. It says that the tzitzit are supposed to be made from the same thing as the garment. The same thing as the corner, but the same thing as the garment. So therefore it says, Hainu Bechinas Sar Reishi, the head of his, the, sar, her, the hairs of his head, Ka'amar Nake is like white wool. Did I say here wool? I'm sorry. Catholic, this is snow, I'm sorry. The garments should be like white, his garments are like white snow, and his hairs are like white wool. So it says because the 
the tzitzit are supposed to be the same thing as the garment. And it says clearly the tzitzit are supposed to be made from wool. The tzitzit are supposed to be made from wool. So therefore we make the garment also from wool and the color should also be white because in Daniel it says white. That's the point, right? So Lamed Beit Chutim, these 32 strands of the tzitzit, they correspond to, how do you with 32? There's eight on each corner. Eight on each corner. Eight times four is 32, right? So it says 32 strands. Those are the 32 paths of wisdom. 32 paths of wisdom. Where do we get that there's 32 paths of wisdom? It says in the book of formation, Sefer Yetzirah, that there's 32 paths of wisdom. That's what it says. Sefer Yetzirah was a book given by God. It says to Abraham, explaining all the secrets of the upper worlds. So it says there's 10 spherot, and that there's the 50 gates of understanding and 32 uh, paths of wisdom. As Mash and Nimshach, the, these two 32 paths of wisdom, that's what's drawn down in order to illuminate the ear and to enliven this inner mamalika omim that's, that's in the world. That's the wisdom of God. That's the Torah. That's this inner aspect of God that creates all the details of the world. Like it says, that's Chachma is called, God's Chachma, that's called Reishi, the beginning of Revelation. Okay, that corresponds to the 32 strings of the tzitzit, because 32 is connected with Chachma, with God's wisdom. This is the 32 paths. My team said, Timot said. <clears throat> okay, so again, these strings, uh, that represents the details of creation, how God creates all the details and fills the worlds. And it is made of the same stuff. This, the strings are made of the same thing as the garment. The garment is how God surrounds all the worlds and above all the worlds. And that's the whole idea of and kavod el Torah. There's no honor, glory, except for Torah. The word glory also is the numerical value of 32. Uh, I told you this was going to be Kabbalistic a little bit. 32. Chaf is 20, Vav Dalet is 10, that's 30, and base is 2, the same thing. Kavod, that's in the 32 paths of wisdom. So that is the Torah, that's the details, that's how God fills the worlds. Like we say, blessed is the glory of God from his place. Okay. And we should look at another place. The Rebbe is giving us all these other um, the Hasidic discourses that explain all these aspects. <clears throat> Okay, so you can ask yourself a question of why all these details, what's the big thing? Just say God is one, and that's it, right? One mimer, and that's it. But the world is very diverse, and it's very complicated. And every detail of it is godly. And that's what Hasidah is trying to explain, why God makes so many details. And big tzaddikim, a big, like King says, says that King Solomon, he could understand the speech of the palm trees, what do palm trees have to, get, have to say? But he could nevertheless understand that there's some message being given over by every detail of the world. And that's these details. That's the 32 paths of wisdom, which are in, in the end, in every detail of the world. Okay, to explain this, first of all, we have to understand what is this inner light of God and what is the surrounding light of God. <clears throat> and this is also called by other name in Kabbalah, which is called Igulim V'yosher. Okay, so here we have <clears throat> three sets, three pairs, <clears throat> which are basically referring to the same thing. Three as different aspects of God, which come in <clears throat> pairs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Generally, we have what's called how God surrounds the world and fills the world. Then we also have or maki for panimi, a surrounding light and an inner light. And we also have what's called igulim, which means a circle, the yosher, and a line. Okay, so these are all aspects of what God uses to create the world. Now, this is, of course, we're talking after the fact, right? We're talking about after the fact. God already created the world, and just there's, he revealed certain people like the Arizal. What are the details behind this whole business? <clears throat> And because simply you can say, okay, God created the world, let him do whatever he wants to. So he just created it. It's like, you know, you have a, a, a book by, uh, you know, written by, you know, Shakespeare. Shakespeare. 
So you you want to have to understand you want to understand the book of Shakespeare. You have to understand how the tongue works, how the impulses from the brain that go through the spine. You don't have to understand that stuff. What do you, what do you care about? How the right? You're a beautiful a pianist playing some beautiful music. In order to understand that, you have to understand how the the sinews are affected by the nerves and how they relate the feelings of the fingers back. To, you don't have to understand that stuff. We have all you have to do is listen to the music, right? Same thing with the world. You can appreciate the world, and that's enough. It says it's not enough. We have to, we're trying to understand a little bit of the process of the inside anatomy of creation. Creation. And th- by doing that, you can start to ex- understand, first of all, the reality of the creator, because the creator is creating the spiritual worlds, which in many ways are much more real than here, in our physical world, and they're all creations. But, <clears throat> but also you can understand that the details, the care that God takes creating everything. So there's these three doubles, which are basically talking about the same thing. It's how God fills the world and surrounds the world. Another sort of name for the same thing is an inner light and a surrounding light. And there's also another name for basically the same thing is what's called igulim v'yosher, surrounding and straight. Okay. So it says, in it is like this, that which we call the light of God, an inner light or an outer light. Inner light, that's what goes in into the vessels. The beginning is Yosher. And that's the, also this aspect of how God is straight, coming down, straight. Vadarga, Maila, Umata. That's what's called up and down. Chabad, Chagas, Nehi. So that's how we get that God is high up and the world is down. The world is down. What do you mean it's up and down? God is everywhere. And he says, yes, true, God is everywhere. But that's the other aspect of God. That's how God surrounds the world. But now we're talking about how God creates a world, and it seems to be that there's a source and that there is a result. And the source, that's what's called <clears throat> or makifa surrounding. And the result is what's called or panimi, or the source is what's called igulim, how God surrounds all being. And yosher, that's the creation itself. In the Torah, this idea of Yosher is talking about speech, when God speaks. But it says that before God spoke, there was God, right? By Yomer Elohim, that God spoke. Of course, in, it should be the other way, Elohim Omar. God was there first, and then he spoke. The essence of God, that's what's called the surrounding level. And that God speaks, that's another aspect of God. That's what's called Yosher straight, right? <laughs> Okay, and that we said is represented also by the tzitzit, right? We said this is the tzitzit, the garment. That represents how God surrounds everything, how he is the source of everything, how he is a circle, so to speak, everything. That's what's called the garment. But from the garment comes these strings. So everything you see in the world is really coming from God's oneness. Of course, this is all not to be taken uh, this is a metaphor, if you want to call it. Don't think that, in fact, God is really very high. He's somewhere up above, you know, the solar system or something, or the, 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 the galaxies or something. God is really a, a person sitting behind his veil, or like a big, 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 big angel. Or something. It's not so. God is ultimate reality. And from his reality comes all these sub-realities, which are called the world. And that's what it means that God speaks. Okay. So that's this idea of the chut. When God created the world, he created the world, it says, with a, a beam of God cre- of creative light. And that is what's called the kava chut. That's what's called the beam or the strand, which is drawn down from or in so from God's infinite light, is an order that should be drawn down into an inner light that the world should be able to receive godliness so that there should be a world with angels and then that spiritual worlds and there's different types of angels and then there should be a Physical world, that there, 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 there should be people and animals and vegetables. That's what's called namalikom. And it shines in every world according to its ability to receive. But the level of how God surrounds the world, this is an aspect of godliness which surrounds all the worlds equally from the beginning to the end. From the beginning of Ak, Ak is the beginning of what's called this kav, of, the, of, the, of God's speech. 
from before, from the highest levels to the lowest levels. Okay, we're going to see in a moment that that's what Korach wanted. Korach wanted the whole world, and Judaism especially, should be only according to the surrounding light. He didn't like this idea of all the strands and all the details and et cetera, et cetera. That he didn't like. Right? Okay, let's let's go. <clears throat> One second. I want to, even though this is not a usual practice, but I want to skip. We're going to skip. Where are we going to skip to? We're going to see in a moment. Because it goes more and more into these details, and it's really very beautiful, to tell you the truth. But I don't know if, if it's going to be interesting to everybody. Okay. Okay, the Indian is like this. We can say that that's the whole idea of the strands, the blue strands of the blue strands of the tzitzit, that that's what Korach was arguing about, right? So there was big repercussions. Moses could have said, okay, you don't want to do tzitzit, so leave me alone. Don't do tzitzit, so what are you going to, you have to depose me just because that, we're going to see that there's big, big repercussions in this whole thing that the a surrounding what the tzitzis are, this surrounding light, and you know, and what reality is. What's the job of the Jews? If <clears throat> the tzitzit are drawing down this inner light from this surrounding light, right, surrounding light, so if it was just an individual thing, so Moses could say, okay, listen, I, it makes it so big, uh, important to you, Korach, so leave me alone, and you know, do what do you think. He says, no, 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 no. Korach said, no way. You are not going to be the leader anymore. You're not going to be the leader anymore. What is this? Is this one? Yeah. Okay. So now we have to understand what is the idea of this blue string. Kehine, the word techelet, the word blue, also is the language of tichle, destroy. Shiyichle v'yiv'arara, that it will destroy and they say burn up. Uh, this means to burn up, uh, to, to destroy, to destroy and to eliminate hara, the bad from within us. Oh. So this blue strand is designed to. Just one second, one second, one second. Hello. Ani ani be'em so mashu ati yochel tzaltzal bo'od chetisha. Okay, Tishma, Tikanesta Kvarchabad Kvarchabad, Bekikara Rishon, Shatanesta Kvarchabad, Tifne Yamina with the Tzalayot Pam. Tov? Ah, one second, one second. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Ah, I can't pause it from here. Excuse me, one second. Isn't this my... Okay, listen, I'll, let, let's just finish this. Excuse me. One minute. Stop it.